I think we we'll start by talk by thanking all of you for having us come over from Delhi and uh, giving us the opportunity to present, I would say, a point of view which is probably uh, personal as well. So with that, I start. Over the years, I have tried to decipher our built environment, the overcrowded cities and its architecture, and this search has led me like to the classic Indian fable of the blind man and the elephant to eventually reach a single governing factor that in more ways than one connects and controls our lives and the cities we live in. On thinking things out, it increasingly appeared to me that the influence of money all pervading, be it in issues of housing, urban sprawl, or the practice of architecture today. All the threats that I had gathered earlier seem to be to the ever increasing role of money in the world today. In effect, money has become the proverbial elephant in the home. I will attempt to analyze this paramount role written out for money to star in and its domination on the means and methods of production, control of global commerce, the growth of mega cities, and thereby the very lives of people who live and work in them. Today, market economy not only controls the lives of those who live in urban areas, but also the rural population of India. The Adivasi tribes, the aborigines who had lived unchanged for thousands of years in the jungles of India, were probably the only human beings who were virtually unaffected by money. However, the natural propensity of market economy to convert to the mission of disease, those so far untouched by the ideas of development, has led to standoffs between the state and the Adivasis in some parts of the country. What then is money? Money as we know from its history is a product of urbanization. Money is essential to a person's existence in a city where people can live without being actually involved in producing the essentials that are required to survive on this earth. The urban population, for instance, does not grow its own food or grow its own cloth. Instead, it buys these essentials of daily living. Buying involves a common currency of exchange, and money, while fulfilling this role, eliminates the need to barter goods and services. In current dominance as paper money, uh, sorry, its current dominance as paper money has its genesis in the restructuring of the monetary system in pre-Victorian England in the early days of the Industrial Revolution. Money as we know it is not a real thing. It's an abstract construct of value created for purposes of convenience that people jointly agree to believe in. Purchasing this money in the form of currency notes is therefore more like an act of faith. Money is ascribed to the value by common consent, which is believed to be equivalent to the, to the worth of the goods that are to be bought. So as you can see here, the governor has written, I promise to pay the bearer the sum of 1,000 rupees. So this piece of paper, which is the currency note, is not the actual value that you are exchanging goods with. So the value of money lasts as long as people have reason to believe in its worth. When for a variety of reasons the commonly held belief is compromised, money is devalued causing inflationary conditions which if not corrected will eventually lead to financial meltdown. As opposed to the inconveniences and restrictions of a barter system, money has the ability to circulate as currency across political and geographical boundaries. In turn, money, unlike the barter system, gives rise to a host of goods and services, the production of which the consumer is not directly involved in. Through the process of buying and selling, by the time the product reaches the actual user, the monetary value of the product keeps appreciating well beyond what was originally determined by the actual producer. The abstraction created by using money and assigning value can therefore also be manipulated by powerful groups to control or create a false value for products and services, as is seen in the case of real estate speculation. Corollary to 
this is the other strategies regularly resorted to generate demand and simultaneously create an artificial scarcity to increase the perceived value of the goods. Once divested from the reality on the ground as an abstraction, it becomes possible for the currency system to be so designed, and here you can read the quote as well, uh, as to foster competition among the users rather than cooperation. Money is also the hidden uh, engine of the perpetual growth treadmill that has become the hallmark of industrial society. The problem of ascribing the monetary value to all goods that human society needs creates distortion in the way people perceive what constitutes the essentials of life. This sort of trader mentality has swept across the globe, largely in the industrial and post-industrial periods of the Western world, the outcome of which manifested itself in the two world wars. Today, the battles over controlling territories and therefore resources and markets have morphed into many smaller wars that smolder like forest fires across the surface of the earth. So architecture is one. What does that mean? Discernible change in recent times brought by money on architecture and the outdoor environment has been witnessed within a single human lifespan. Though the process of change had set in much earlier during the colonial period, this quote from Rabindranath Tagore's essay, The Modern Age, published in 1922, conveys the changes brought on the Indian landscape. So he's talking about Calcutta, and he says, Calcutta is an upstart town with no depth of sentiment in her face and in her manners. It may truly be said about the genesis. In the beginning, there was a spirit of the shop which uttered through its megaphone, let there be the office, and there was Calcutta. She brought with her no dower of distinction, no majesty of noble or romantic origin. She never gathered around her any great historical associations, any annals of brave sufferings or memory of mighty deeds. The only thing which gave her the sacred baptism of beauty was the river. I was fortunate enough to be born before the smoke belching iron dragon had devoured the greater part of the life of its banks. When the landing stairs descending into its waters caressed by its tides appeared to me like the loving arms of the villages clinging to it, when Calcutta with her uplifted nose and stony stare had not completely disowned her foster mother, rural Bengal, and had not surrendered body and soul to her wealthy paramour, the spirit of the ledger bound in dead leather. So this is how Calcutta would have looked in those days. You can see the smoke coming out of the factory that they overhated so much and the way the landscape changes because of it. So Tagore has seen and lamented the changes in the early part of the 20th century. After 69 years of becoming a sovereign republic, this change has unfortunately gathered momentum, especially after the so-called liberalization of the socialistic Indian economy. Dominant architecture has also moved away from socialistic ideals. So this is by one of the earliest uh, post-independence architects, Habib Rehman, and this is the, uh, the academy building in Delhi, the three academies, Sangeet Natak, Dalit Kala, and the Sahitya Academy. So architecture has also moved away from socialist ideals. Today, architecture strives value through monetary terms and square footage of grid space. Today, housing complexes, and sometimes even houses, are being conceived as 80, even 100-story structures, pushed up artificially. Uh, by artificially hiked land prices, which in turn push the floor space index literally through the roof. Even higher secondary schools are forced to build up to six-story blocks in cities like Bhuvaneshwar to capitalize on the land cost and bylaw provisions. With higher land costs, saving time means saving money, which in turn pushes design and construction towards mechanization, <coughs> industrial products, and structures put together by large construction companies. Mainstream architecture today is a natural heir of modern architecture, which post-1947 was increasingly imported into India. India then had an extensive living tradition of highly sophisticated craft traditions and skills that flourished in the building trade. 
what is wrong with manufacturing industries had to be established through a major restructuring program. This restructuring, as a part of India's overall economic and social restructuring through industrialization, Wolfgang Sachs, in his essay, The Archaeology of the Development Idea, writes, to increase production at a constant level, entire societies had to be overhauled. Had there ever existed a more zealous state objective? From then on, an unprecedented flowering of agencies and administrations came forth to address all aspects of life, to count, organize, mindlessly intervene, and sacrifice all in the name of development. Today, the same appears more like collective hallucinations. Traditions, hierarchies, mental habits, the whole texture of societies have all been dissolved in the planner's mechanistic model. But in this way, the experts were able to apply the same blueprint for institutional reform throughout the world, the outline which was often patterned on the American way of life. The earlier craft skill based system of design and construction of buildings was largely replaced by the central public works department system that promoted modern architecture. The CPWD system uniformly standardized construction methods, specifications, and contractual agreements across the country. The CPWD specifications insist on standard engineering solutions, so much so that whatever may be the function of the building to be built, it is almost invariably conceived as reinforced cement concrete construction. With the result, in cities today, any other form of construction like mud bricks or thatch roofs will be deemed substandard and therefore will not be given permission for construction by city authorities. Over the years, the CPWD specifications have removed items such as lime plaster and lime punning of all surfaces, essentially works that require craftsmanship. Through a process that is governed by an increasing domination of industrial products and mechanization, building construction is being steadily removed from the realm of craftsmen to that of pre-engineered products and systems. Industrial products come with large carbon footprints and high energy embodied as cost in manufacturing, which all goes towards damaging the planet's ecology. Pre-engineered products are also designed to not only uh, so decide to not rely upon local craftsmanship during installation on site. This means that the bulk of the money spent on construction today finds its way back to the distant and often multinational manufacturers and their global distribu distributors with very little of the money trickling down to help the local economy. Uh, I came across this quote very recently, which is by a nutritionist and author, who says that life buildings, diets also need to be timeless and sustainable. We have to stay fit and healthy for the rest of our lives. Stop talking about food groups like carbs, proteins and fats and start thinking about food systems. So it's not about specialization but maybe generalization. Food systems are about not just looking after your health but also promoting local economy and global economy. Very similar thought process in the, in the production of food. So the resultant quality of architecture generated by the traditional versus contemporary practices is also quite apparent. The unattract unattractive box-like buildings which characterized the doctrine of modern architecture has today been repackaged into glamorous corporate avatars in the garb of glass curtain walling and ACP panels. These buildings, slightly repackaged and often outlandish in shape, stand out for what they are not. It is not surprising that almost all traditional buildings, regardless of the fact that they are owned by economically poorer families or wealthy ones, are beautiful to be old and comfortable to live in and do minimum damage to the environment. Now, both these slides are from Jaisalmer. So you have the rich man's house and you have the poor man's house all coexisting within the same city. Whereas it is only rarely that we come across examples of modern architecture that could be called truly beautiful. And additionally, they are often impractical and uncomfortable to live in. So this is the walkie-talkie building in London, which is reputed to melt cars. Unfortunately, repackaged modernist boxes have become standardized symbols of development and material progress across the world. 
legitimized by a small but powerful group of the ruling, ruling elite, <coughs> policy makers, executives, and technocrats, who are all interestingly urbanized, like me, usually with higher degrees of education, like a lot of us here, but with hardly any real skills to build with their hands. Today, craft has become absent even from the basics of the so-called construction industry. Good masons with the skill to construct a brick wall properly are a rare breed. In our country, with its still existing vast pool of human resources, it makes practical sense to design buildings that incorporate the skills and competence of the people who construct them. However, the way we are trained and practice architecture make us follow, like the economy of money, a top-down process with a single point of control and decision making. Here I want to show you some of the works. This is by our own office. Where you can see in the inset the actual people whom we collaborated with to make this. In fact, this uses locally available material and skills. The structure was actually built by a bus body builder. Now this is in the city or near the city of Delhi. And uh, another project in the same campus which uses simpler construction techniques. And this is in one of the villages in Tamil Nadu by another architect, Deep Krishna. And this is the team which put it together using mud bricks and tiles and thatch. So these are materials that are available there and you can see the people actually constructing. The other way to practice architecture becomes apparent with people to understand the difference in the, in the objectives of a master builder of traditional architecture and those practicing mainstream architecture today. So what are the differences in objectives between the traditional builder and people like me? The qualifications of a master builder as defined in the Mayavada, we just heard about the Mayavada in the previous lecture, are of interest here as it also specifies moral characteristics of such a profession. This is the quote. And what I have done is that I have increased the point size of the parts which we do not ever abstract to architects. So he is of mixed class, a man of quality. Just, compassionate, disinterested, free from envy, without weakness, must be straightforward, he must be attentive and free of the seven vices, and persevering, and he must have crossed the ocean of science of architecture. This is apart from the stuff that all of you learn in college or what we all learned in college. And they lay importance to these qualities of the human being. Therefore, aesthetics, uh, sorry, therefore, uh, architects or master craftsmen of the past created exquisite works of architecture not merely for monetary gain, but as an opportunity to discover their own capabilities. For the sheer pleasure of creating something beautiful or as an act of devotion and possibly to gain social appreciation for their skills. Interestingly, recent research by the economists at MIT in the USA show that higher monetary incentives improved performance of people who did jobs that required mechanical skills. However, strangely enough, once the jobs demanded, and here I quote from the document, even rudimentary cognitive skills, a large reward led to poorer performance. Joseph. This may explain the attitude of craftsmen excelling at their work in creating exquisite architecture, unworried about fixing a price or a monetary value to the end product. This may also be, the, be a reason for the decline in the quality of architecture, despite huge improvements in fees paid to architects today. This attitude towards creation and work as something not necessarily influenced by money may still be seen amongst some of the classical Indian musicians the deep devotion to their art can be witnessed firsthand at a live concert. Master builders of the past and craftspersons have created architecture in the same manner as the musicians by putting in long years at apprenticeships and finally getting the chance to prove their skills in public. This was possible in a society that was not entirely governed by money. It is interesting to note here that in the past societies that allowed such expressions of creativity were feudal ones. Today, urban conditions governed by money through real estate do not allow the creation of a city that is more inclusive or pleasurable as the ones built in the past. <coughs> Pre-modern architecture was based upon principles of efficiency and economy 
that ensures design and decisions through the entire design and construction process. This is visible in aspects of space planning, construction design, and the use of building materials. The form and appearance of the buildings from the past clearly reflects the structural system, the properties of the materials used, and methods of construction followed. The construction materials and methods were rolled out and dubbed as low tech in today's parlance. However, buildings built in the past have largely withstood the ravages of time. In contrast, despite the so-called high-tech or technologically advanced construction systems and materials used today, most buildings of this era seem to age in a remarkably short period of time. Traditional buildings need to be understood from the context of their time, the achievements of the master builders and craftspersons involved in building them, which were no less sophisticated than the complex structures built today. The traditional master builders evolved to a very high level of achievement given the methods of working and the materials used by them. It may not be easy, if not downright impossible, to build such buildings today, such as the Dhaka Mantra in Delhi, the Bolbumba in Bijapur, the Vedeshwa Temple at Kanto, and this despite the scientific analytical design skills and advanced construction technology and project management methods employed today. The problem lies not only in the standardization of monoculture construction methods through the CPWD system, but also exists within the system of education imparted to the students of architecture throughout the country. This is where I believe we will be able to find the space for change. Architectural education, on the whole, largely ignores the role of the traditional craftsman and the architecture the pitch. Even during field trips, trips to historic sites, emphasis is laid on documentation through measure drawing, sketching, and photographing buildings. Very rarely does a student of architecture find the opportunity to understand the highly evolved traditional craft of design and construction that actually created the building or settlement. We need to incorporate the understanding of traditional skills and systems in the architecture syllabus, not as study of history and architecture for the loan, but as a positive alternative to current construction and design methods. Masons, carpenters, blacksmiths, and laborers can all become a part of the design and construction process rather than relegating them to mindlessly pouring concrete, constructing brick walls labeled 230 tech on construction drawing. <coughs> In the industrialized Western world, traditional handcrafting has almost died out and thereby has become exclusive and often unaffordable. In India, handcrafted products are still used by the poorest. For example, the simple clay pot crafted by the neighborhood potter is still used to cook rice or store water. The involvement of crafts and architecture essentially involves people and works towards a more humane architecture process. Handcrafting in energy is the very opposite of standardized mass production. Large scale organizations and basic infrastructure provisions. Handcrafting is essentially about being local, about being frugal, about conserving resources, about creating a sophisticated response to a site and project by thoughtful design. Handcrafting respects the individuality of the artist, their creativity, and fixes the responsibility for quality and time management all to individuals and guilds. It also ensures that the economic benefits generated through this process of building reaches the local community. However, we need to also understand that we cannot reverse the clock. A lesson can be learned from Egyptian architect Hassan Fatih's efforts in introducing mud construction as a practical, viable, cost-effective method to house his country's poor. As George H. Bracken in his book, Appearance for Thorn notes, that Fatih's well-meaning efforts failed since he behaved as a professional architect, controlling the end product in a top-down process with almost no involvement of the end users in decision making. So you can see that the top left is the way Fatih had built it, and the bottom right is what has happened to Gordon today. The result was that a partially completed village at Gorda was eventually transformed piecemeal by families that had occupied it. Abraham analyzed Fatih's experience to say, for a form to be a part of a culture, it must be congruent with the interests that are peculiar for that day and age. He further says, thus the lesson is not that the form ought to stay for reasons of beauty, cost efficiency, climate or geography, but that each time again a match must be found 
between people and forms, and only when it is found, both will prosper. Here, I would like to quote a passage from Javed Malik's introduction to the English translation of Abhi Tanvi's hugely popular play, Charakla's Stone, which was also written for film by Shah Menegal. Uh, then we wrote this play for enactment by folk artists. So, Javed Malik writes, his project from the beginning of his career has been to harness elements of the folk traditions as a vehicle and make them new contemporary meanings and produce a theater with a, which has a touch of the soil about it. However, then we also recognizes and respects the immense creativity of the folk imagination. His approach is not exploitative in the sense of merely using the folk for one's own ends. In fact, he is quite careful not to create a hierarchy by privileging in any absolute and extrinsic way his own educated consciousness and poet come playwright come director over the unschooled creativity of his actors. In his work, the two usually meet and in interpenetrate as it were, as equal partners in a collective collaborative endeavor in which each gives and takes from and thus enriches the other. I would like to end this essay with the reminder that architecture to empowering people is possible mostly at locally manageable scales of buildings such as houses, schools, colleges, healthcare facilities, which are the bulk of the construction activity across the country. And that projects such as star hotels, shopping malls, airports, or mega venues like the Commonwealth Games of 2010 are only a small percentage of the total volume of construction in the country. Unfortunately, it is this small percentage of projects that we architects are trained to or even aspire to design. In my search for an alternative to the architecture of money, I have found the following two quotes to be inspired. The first is by Ravindranath Tagore and the other by Mahatma Gandhi, both giants in their own rights who were also close friends despite differences of opinion. So Tagore wrote that there are some who are insularly modern who believe that the past is bankrupt time, leaving no assets for us but only the legacy of debts. They refuse to believe that the army marching forward can be fed from the rear. It is well to remind them that the great ages of the Renaissance in history were those when men suddenly discovered the seeds of thought in the granary of the past. The unfortunate people who have lost the harvest of the past have lost their present age. And Gandhi did wrote that I want the cultures of all lands to be blown about my house as freely as possible, but I refuse to be blown off my feet by any. I refuse to live in other people's houses as an interloper, a beggar or a slave. I refuse to part, put the unnecessary strain of learning English upon my sisters for the sake of false pride or questionable social advantage. I would have our young men and young women with literary taste to learn as much of English and other world languages as they like and then ex ex expect them to give the benefits of their learning to India and to the world like a post, a Roy or the poet himself. So this he had written in response what they were having. Thank you very much.